you, you think about those those folks in war in the trench together, and you always say, "What were what were you fighting for?" I was fighting for the guy next to me, right? You, you think about those people in war who jump on a grenade. Well, why the heck would they do that, right? They did it for the other. They did it for the other person. They they did it because they could. Yeah. And and the same then applies to the employer. What do we do? Well, we do right for you because we can. Hello and welcome to Love as a Business Strategy, a podcast that brings humanity to the workplace. We're here to talk about business, but we want to tackle topics that most business leaders shy away from. We believe that humanity and love should be at the center of every successful business. Hello, I'm your host, Jeff Ma, and as always, I want to have conversations with real people and hear real stories about how the real world works with love. My guest today has just recently retired from a 37-year career with ExxonMobil. Starting back when it was still Exxon Chemical, he's worked in engineering, project management, sales, account management, sales management, market development, technology licensing, change management. I'm missing a bunch here. But ultimately, training and consulting across the entire enterprise as well. So he's here today, not just to talk about that, but I'm interested in him sharing the inspirational philosophy and wisdom that he's built over those years. His name is Martin Levine, and I'll be calling him Marty today. Welcome to the show, Marty. How are you? Oh, thank you. Great to be here. Sorry if there's a cat in the background. Um, I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> I think in the world of virtual, I think yeah, three we're... cats. They just wander around. So animals are are common now. <laughs> so you spent almost four decades at exxon mobile tell us yeah. just let's start there what's that like well you know i i it, it was uh it was a good career uh i uh i'm one of those guys that uh did not uh, come from a professional background really my, i worked in a lumber yard uh i went to georgia tech and then i got out and went to work at exxon mobile so it was kind of a totally new thing for me but you know you you uh you you learn you you put your head down, uh, you make some mistakes, uh, you try to keep a good attitude, uh, you try to build a network, uh, and you try to uh, just to do better. And so for me, uh, you know, it was, it was always a learning experience. Uh, I always enjoyed new challenges. Uh, I learned early on that I really liked, I was an engineer by training, but I learned I really liked to do uh, people-oriented things, and in particular sales uh, and marketing, and later I got into procurement. So. I always tend to say I like to be at the tip of the spear, right? Where where money's going out or coming in or whatever. Uh, to me, that's the the exciting part of a business. So it was it was good. Awesome. What what um, I guess is your passion? Maybe that that kind of goes down the spine of that entire experience. Like what what's your passion? Yeah, you know, the uh, the last few years of my career, I was able to to really work on that actually, and it's it's really this. Um, this understanding of how people do business and how sales people operate, how procurement people operate, how strategies work or should work and how they should be put in place. And uh, really just helping people understand that because I find there's a lot of sort of inefficiency uh, in those relationships uh, because people are you know hiding stuff that they probably uh, don't need to hide and people need to cooperate and collaborate more uh, than, they, than they really do sometimes, right? And so it really, it's probably where my passion is, is to try to help people do better business uh, by being um, more open appropriately uh, in order to get things done. Well, Marty, um, I got um, really intrigued to talk to you today because you had started um, explaining a few things to me about love. And I, I know that um, you're, this is, this could be connected to your Exxon experience. I, I don't know. You can tell me. But um, I know that you have um, studied quite a bit and been very passionate about um, a book by C.S. Lewis, The Four Loves. And what you had to say about that really, really intrigued me. And I was wondering if you could um, start there for me a little bit. What what is What is love for you? Sure. Yeah, I, I don't think this is particularly tied to my career. This is more of an interest of mine. I, I had uh, 
read uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, book uh, some years ago. Actually, it's a series of lectures. You can actually listen to them on Audible. They're quite interesting. Uh, but, uh, you know, C.S. Lewis, he lived back, he was probably one of the great minds of the last century. He was an English literature um, uh, sort of, I guess, a critic of sorts at Oxford and uh, Cambridge. But he also did a lot of, you know, fiction works, the Chronicles of Nardia. And then as a Christian, uh, a lot of uh, apologetics, most best known being uh, mere Christianity. So anyway, he tackled this subject of love. Um, but this is, I think, back in the 40s, actually. And what he did is he laid out really two, two types of love. He said there's, there's, there's gift love and there's need love. And gift love is like the love um, a parent has for their children, right? They, they, all they do is give and they don't really you know, necessarily get anything back. Need love is what the children have. They actually need the love of the parent, right? Because they need to, to live and be raised. So he, he explained those two things first. And then he got in talking about sort of four expressions of love. And this is what I thought when I when I read the book, actually, Love is a Business Strategy, I said, well, it's interesting. How can we unpack what C.S. Lewis had to say about love in the context of this book to maybe help understand how we might better apply this concept of love in, sort of in the workplace? Hmm. So Lewis really describes uh, three what he calls natural loves. Uh, one of them is affection, um, or he calls it storge is the Greek word for it. Uh, the second one is philia, which is uh, friendship, the Greek love for friendship, I guess, philia. And the third is eros, which is romantic love. And so he describes those three as what he calls natural loves. And we, what I mean by natural is they, they're they subject to corruption in a sense. They, they can be wonderful, beautiful things, but they can also become sort of bad things. Hmm. And he talks about the fourth love, which is uh, he calls the Greek word is agape. Sometimes we use the word charity. It's it's in essence in essence God's love. And is the basic premise of the of the lectures is, and this is again from a Christian perspective. We're trying to apply this to a business perspective. Is that this this charity, this love of God, uh, is it will set these other three loves right, so that they can in a sense be perfected. Uh, otherwise, they can become in a, in essence bad things, and if you want, I can I can go through each one of them, and explain how that might happen, because maybe it's not it's not obvious. Yeah, and I think one of my again excitements in getting a chance to talk to you today was that we, um, I guess, the English language has the one word love, and we use it in this podcast and the book. Sure. We use it all the time, and it's it's absolutely you know correct that there are so many different ways. Uh, that you can mean love when you say love, the different types of love and all yeah. these different things. And I don't think, I think people can easily get tripped up on that, especially when we say love as a business strategy, like what type of love do you mean? And so I was hoping we could explore that today and you having, um, you know, read the book a little bit and, and having all this experience, I was hoping you could help connect those for us today when it comes to, um, yes, let's absolutely if you don't mind, dive into yeah. those different types of expressions of love and then and then maybe lead to the answer of like, well, what are we talking about then when we're talking about love as a business strategy? Let me, let me what I'll do, uh, Jeff, so I'll, let me go through each. I'll go through one and then we'll talk a bit about it and then we'll, it, I'll go through the next one. But Perfect. So the first one, the simplest one is, is storge or, uh, or affection, right? It's, it's a very humble love, right? It's very, in a sense, familiar. Um, you know, oftentimes uh, we have affection for things. When, when you realize we have affection for something, it's probably already been there for a while. You don't fall into affection with something like you fall into love. It's something you sort of develops and then suddenly you realize it's there. And it doesn't have to be between a person and a person. It could be between you and your dog or, or even some sentimental object, right? So it, it doesn't really discriminate in a sense. Um, it, in a sense, you know, for our existence, um, affection is necessary, right? We, we're, we're humans are born little babies. We have to be raised. Uh, goodness knows I had small kids and they can be absolutely exasperating. And it wasn't for affection. We'd probably just, you know, give them to somebody, right? Because <laughs> it can really drive you crazy. Yeah. But it, so in a sense, it's, it's really sort of, it's really sort of necessary for us. But let me read a little passage from the book just quickly to explain what I mean by this. But even in animal life, and still more in our own, affection extends far beyond the relationship of mother and young. The warm comfortableness, the satisfaction of being together takes in all sorts of objects. 
It is indeed the least discriminating of loves. There are women for whom we can predict few wooers and men who are likely to have few friends. They have nothing to offer, but almost anyone can become an object of affection. The ugly, the stupid, even the exasperating. Uh, the language obviously he uses is perhaps a bit out of taste in, in today's world, but the, the fact is almost anything, anyone, can become an object of affection. It's not, it's not particularly discriminating, right? Mm. Which is interesting. Now, the problem is, is that the downsides of affection are, uh, well, if, if you give somebody uh, affection and don't get anything in return, then you tend to get upset about it, right? Uh, it, become, it can become injured. It can become jealous. It, you can say, you know, because I love you and you're my child or whatever, I don't ever want you to leave even though leaving may be good for you. You see this actually in a lot of movies, right? Where the, the hero wants to go off and do something great and someone's trying to hold him back, right? Hmm. That, that's the downside of affection, right? It, 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 can, it can, in a sense, uh, trap somebody. And that's, that's the problem with it. But, it, it, but it, 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 we need to have it because we need to be raised. We need to be loved. We need to have that, that feeling that we're being loved. At the same time, it can become a problem. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, um, I believe there is romantic love somewhere down the line in the next, in the other section, sure. but how is it different just right off the bat? Like, how is it different from romantic love? It, it, it's uh, affection and romantic love actually kind of go uh, side by side. I think in, I'm trying to get Lewis's book. He basically said, maybe this is a Southern thing where we have potatoes and gravy, but he often described it as, as almost like affection is like the, the little bowl you make in your potatoes for your gravy and, and romance is in a sense uh, what goes in there. Uh, romantic love is, is surrounded by expressed by affection. So when you think, yeah. when you think love as a business strategy, what, what percentage, if any of that is, is affection type love? I think, I think a lot of it, I think a lot of it can, in a sense, be, you know, affection. Uh, again, they all kind of go together. And I think when we get towards the end, we talk about, about uh, sort of the, the ultimate love or charity. We'll kind of maybe see a bit better how they fit together. But I think you can certainly have affection for your employees. Mm -hmm. You can have affection, you know, you, you, you want the best for them, right? That's the good side of it. Affection wants the best for the beloved, right? The downside is, okay, and you got to watch out for this. I think, I think all these laws we have to watch out. The downside is it becomes jealous, right? Um, you, you have a colleague you're working with and you want them to do well, but then suddenly they do well, they're going to be transferred to another department, get a promotion. Oh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's the downside of affection. Uh, Makes a, sense. A, a true affection should always want the best for the beloved. And that, that would apply to people who you work with. Does that make does that make sense? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. What's the next one? The next one is uh, is philia or friendship. Now, friendship is in a sense not as necessary as affection. I mean, affection is what helps us be raised. Romance, in a sense, is what helps us be born. Uh, friendship is in a sense uh, sort of less necessary, right? Um, and, and I think a lot of cases it's declined in modern times. Or perhaps in modern times, our friendships aren't as robust as they were in years past. We have all this communication ability now, but do we really communicate with each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's really, but it has a tremendous value, right? Uh, it's, it, it can really, a, a true friendship can truly help us, you know, soar to levels we couldn't be in before. Most friendships tend to be around something, right? An interest, something you're working on together, um, I've uh, tried to, over the years, develop friendships with, with other men, uh, because I find them to be very valuable. And I find that you have to purpose yourself to do it. In fact, what I used to do is take guys out on camping trips. And I find that men tend to become friends if they do something together that almost gets them killed. And then they <laughs> become friends because <laughs> they sit around, they tell the story about what happened and they, you know, embellish it or whatever, and it gets bigger and they... They smack talk the other guy. That's that's how you know these these friendships kind of kind of develop, and so there are way that we that that a, that a small group can together do something that maybe 
you know, you couldn't do by yourself. And, and, and it's so kind of, just, it's yeah. kind of that, um, it's kind of that, I guess, lack of necessity and the effort it requires to yeah. do it that makes it all the more special, right? Fr fr friendship isn't really jealous. At the same time, you know, if if you're friends with somebody or some group or three or three people, that, that sort of says you're not friends with the other ones, right? And so the downside is people look at, at a group of friends and they say, well, I want in that group. And then maybe they're not brought into the group. Maybe the people in the group didn't know they wanted in, who knows. But then because of that, friendship can become an exclusive thing. Hmm. And it can put people off. And those who aren't in the friend group uh, feel put out. And and that's sort of that's sort of the downside of it. And obviously, you know, friend groups can work together to do great things. Or there's a lot of friend groups that are involved in crime, for for example, right? Mm -hmm. So it's that's the that's the downside of it is, is its exclusivity that it can bring. And you know, back to the workforce, the same thing, right? Yeah. Uh, you you want to work together to work towards a common goal as a company, right? You want to drive together. And so, uh, but when you get factions in the company, well, that can that can create some problems. I've always you know, there's a saying that without vision, the people perish. I think it's a it's a proverb. I think it's very important in a company. In a sense, everybody in a company should be part of a friend group in that company, if, if you think about it that way, mm. because you're all working together to do something that you could not singly do. Uh, and, and you are uh, exclusive in that you have competition. You have customers, right? And those are separate from you, but you're working together as friends in a sense to do what you could not do alone does that make sense absolutely yes what's next romance is next now this is a this is a tricky one for the workforce right yeah i was going to so, see what you're going to say about this <laughs> so so you know lovers are in a state of, of, of being in love as i think what uh what uh, lewis said we we often get love and sexual experience mixed up but there are people who have sexual experiences without love and there's people who have love without sexual experience right so those two things are kind of separate in a sense right they they, they come together sometimes but they don't always come together um the, i think the main thing about about eros uh, or, or romantic love in the, is, is is its intensity it's 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 this it's this burning intensity that it has and and that is both its wonder you know when you're in love with somebody, when you fall in love with somebody, it's all you can do is think about them, right? It's all you can do is think about them. At the same time, romantic love in that respect has has the, the downside potential of taking the beloved or even just the idea of being in love and in a sense turning it into a god or something, right? It becomes an almost an object of worship. It will overwhelm you. And I think we've all known people in life who that had to happen to and they maybe fell in love with the wrong person. They wound up doing things they shouldn't have done. Uh, they wound up hurting themselves, hurting others. And they would say it was all because of their love, mm -hmm. but it really, it really forced them to make bad decisions. And in a sense, it was like a drug they were on. So love, love in, a, in that sense has a downside. Yeah. So again, it's this intensity is so amazing, but it has the, the ability on the downside to make you do things that aren't good. That makes sense. Yep. Yep. I think, I think we've all seen that and maybe experienced it ourselves a little bit. Yeah. My God knows I have. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it can turn into hate, right? I mean, you see people who are say they're in love and then something goes sideways and suddenly they just hate each other. Yes. Uh, it, 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 it's a seed for something very dark sometimes. So, yeah. So maybe, maybe not f fully or at least commonly applicable to the workplace, but why don't we talk about, I guess, the, the last kind of the binding type of love yeah. and, and see what how it all comes together. It's and it, we'll we'll kind of explore how it comes together, I think. So again, he Lewis said these three natural loves, uh, friendship, you know, storge, eros are are can be corrupted. And that's in fact what, what they can be. And in the Christian sense, you know, the, the term agape is God's love. And in a sense, as a, as a Christian, you believe that, you know, God created man and then man fell and then God brought the solution to the problem through Christ. And, and, and God did that 
out of his love for mankind. It was it was a pure gift love, right? He he doesn't need anything back from us. He would like to get something back from us, but ultimately, what we need is Him. We have ultimate need love with, with God. Now, to stop right there. It's hard to apply that thinking to the workplace, right? It's not like the employer is God and the employees are man, right? But we, in fact, as as employers and employees. Uh, need each other, right? There's things the employee needs, there's things that the the employer needs. So it's kind of a it's a back and forth. It's a it's a it's a gift love and need love together. So you know analogies usually break down, and this one kind of breaks down there. I think the key point that I get from this as I read through the the the, the book from Lewis that applies to this notion of of, of this type of love is the fact that. You, you can't love without risk. When you set out this book, the, the Love is a Strategy, and you read through what you're going to do, all those things have a risk. And some people might say, well, because it's risky, let's not do it. So if, you, if you fall in love with somebody, it's a risk. They might reject you, right? So there's always a risk in loving. See, Lewis has a fantastic passage. If you'll let me indulge me, I'll read. It's not that long. On this, this notion of the risk of love and why you wouldn't do it. Now, there's two concepts in here. Uh, again, one is heaven, which is where God is, and there's all love, and the one is hell, which is complete separation from God, a place you don't want to be. So those two are in here. But let me read this passage. I think, I think it's powerful. And it speaks to um, th th taking the risk of loving those you work with. There is no safe investment. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that dark casket, safe, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The alternative to tragedy, or at least to the risk of tragedy, is damnation. The only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers and perturbations of love is hell. That's a powerful bunch of words there. And the, the point is, it is a risk. But it's a risk worth taking. If, if uh, when I read, you know, uh, the, the the book, I, I saw at the start, you know, Muhammad kind of separated himself from his employees, right? He he was given advice to not mingle with them, that sort of thing. And in a sense, that's what he was he was doing. He was not loving. He was backing away from them. He was crawling into a coffin, in a sense, mm -hmm. of separation, of not being engaged, of not being involved of not risking hearing something maybe he didn't want to hear or whatever. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of reading some things into this at this point, but I think that's the message here to do what you all are proposing in this book is wonderful. It's, it's a risk, but it's a risk worth taking because the alternative is tragedy, which I think perhaps you all experienced. Yes. And this is such a great, I mean, this is such an eye opening perspective for me um, because the story as written in the book is, it's pretty black and white and it, and it, and it, and it on surface level, it, it also just, it makes a lot of logic sense, easy to follow, but I've, I've yet to really consider it from this perspective of, of that risk. And if you go, if I'm going back right now, mentally and thinking through really everything we've done then and since then, to be honest, has been, you can just characterize and sum it up as kind of less, less risk adverse in the sense of we, yeah. when we practice, when we practice love in our work and in what we preach, essentially, we are willing to kind of put ourselves out there, kind of exposing ourselves. When we talk about vulnerability, we're willing to be wrong, be yeah. shown as weak be shown as you know lesser than and and kind of embracing that is a big part now that i think about it of how we describe love and i've never connected the two before i've often 
considered the elements of fear and things like that, mm -hmm. but never really connected how like the, you know, the direct kind of polar opposite of, of fear or really facing that fear is an act of, or of opening yourself up to love. And that's. Yeah. Love drives out fear. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. And we, and we teach this to people as often as we can is that like, you know, the common workplace culture now is one that's driven by fear. Like the opposite would be fear as a yeah. business strategy, right? Where you're afraid of losing your job. You're afraid of, you know, looking bad, afraid of, you know, getting reprimanded. You have annual reviews. You have all these things that are just designed to keep people in check, but also it instills fear in, yeah. in, in, in what we get is people who really only work enough to not be afraid right yeah, yeah only only do the amount of work that'll get them keep them safe like you said kind of in in their own comfortable coffin and if, if you, you wind up with mediocrity then right exactly uh, and, not and, not with the best there's, there's another concept here that uh, i'll mention that is in the in the book and it's really that charity agape love is is simply loving because you can hmm. i love you because i can love you and, and maybe that's something in the workplace we, we think about, right? With, and working with your colleague, right? Uh, I'm gonna love you just because I can. You, you think about those those folks in war in the trench together, and you always say, what were, what were you fighting for? I was fighting for the guy next to me, right? You, you think about those people in war who jump on a grenade. Well, why the heck would they do that, right? They did it for the other. They did it for the other person. They they did it because they could. Yeah. And and the same then applies to the employer. What do we do? Well, we do right for you because we can. Yeah, and, and such an important and eloquent way of kind of framing everything that I believe in, at least, and that I believe it would help everyone because. Yeah. Um. Man, I talk about this a lot, but I think this this perspective is very, very important to me now. Uh, having having talked through it with you, this element of of that type of love, which is it, the love itself, hasn't changed in my mind. It's just really the way in which it's framed around doing things for others, which we've always said, but also just from a place of of when we define love, being able to just support, lift up help and be selfless for others out of a place of because we can because exactly because we don't need to be afraid of the risk we don't need to be afraid of what that might do to us or cause us in terms of you know any setbacks but because knowing we do it will help others and that i mean that 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 really sums it up i know yeah, there's a lot yeah. a lot there's a lot of other steps for other people to take to connect that all the way back to the to the bottom line in their particular workplace but um no this is powerful for me at least let me let me add one other thing jeff you know I was, as you were talking here you something you said earlier i think you know this this fear right that people have to to do this right um th there are three concepts uh, uh, that there's the uh, people talk about see people say i've lost my faith right what does that mean that they usually means they're fearful but but what I find is that is that there's really three things. There's knowledge, what you know about something, and then there's what you hope about something. So there's there's what people know about working at a place, right? And it, or and it's what they hope about it, what 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 it could be, how wonderful it could be, how good it could be, right? To get from what you you can't have hope in something you don't know about. Yep, you have to start with some knowledge. But what people get afraid of is the risk in between mm -hmm. to get from the current state to the hope for state, which it always involves usually some risk, right? Yeah. In the in the Christian sense, faith is that which connects knowledge with hope. It's the faith that things will be better in the future. And in business, I think a lot of faith comes through our strategies, honestly. They are the action of through which we have, in a sense, faith. Hmm. But there's always that risky moment yeah. when you say, I want to do this thing. And I'm worried it might not work out, but you're driving towards a, a hoped for future and you have faith in doing the right thing. You'll get there. I love it. Well put. And <laughs> wow. Uh, time has slipped away on this conversation. And okay. I, and I think that 
there's a lot more I want to dig into, especially um, I know there's a lot more we can talk about how that type of love can then connect to the other types we talked about, or at least bind them together and sort them out. Um, but we'll definitely say that for another conversation. I know that this has already been very, very helpful for me. And so Marty, I want to appreciate you for coming on the show and, and sharing this with us today. Absolutely. Been a pleasure. Absolutely. And, and, um, I know that, um, this type of conversation, uh, I already know a number of people who really enjoy this conversation because this is one of the big things that we get asked a lot is, is what do you mean by love? And I think the English language does no, no service to, uh, no favors to the word love because that there's just too many different ways that we can be slicing and dicing that word. Yeah. And this, and this conversation is something I'm going to use to help clarify for people what we mean from this point on. So definitely appreciate that. Glad to I all, be of help. Yeah. To our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in as always. Uh, please do check out the book, Love as a Business Strategy for more information. Um, and uh, we appreciate your support all the time. So subscribing, rating, leaving reviews and feedback, always helpful. So with that, we hope you enjoyed this conversation with Marty and we'll see you again next week.